I've been lit on fire. Yeah, I've done some things, but pre that fight for Fincher it was like the most intimidating thing that I've ever done in my career. I'm Dave McCumber, stunt coordinator, fight coordinator, second unit director in the film industry. What was it like working with David Fincher? He was so collaborative. He really kind of executed what the previs was. And I remember <laughs> Fincher turned to me and he's like, am I ruining your art? And it was like, God, no, this is awesome. The Widow, Assassin's Highway. We had these strikes. I took the time to push a little bit further into Unreal from what I had done with the Ronin short. I knew how to open Unreal when I started that. That was it. It's crazy. It's increasingly becoming a tool that I rely on. We spent about eight days with those guys destroying each other, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, how's things your end? Yeah, good. You know, we were through the strike and work starting back up again. And good. That all, which is all great. For people that haven't seen the uh, the Ronin uh, episode, would you like to just reintroduce yourself? Tell us what you do. So I'm Dave McCumber. I'm a stunt coordinator, fight coordinator, second unit director uh, in the film industry. Sometime VFX artist try and figure out how to use Unreal and <laughs> that kind of thing. Do you use it in the professional capacity? I have, yeah. There have been a number of instances where, you know, we've done stunt viz that required quick changes and didn't have the availability of the stunt performers to, you know, come in and, and redo things. So there's been a few instances now where I've jumped into my Rococo suit and done the little extra bits and bobs that I need to, to amend the previs to get it to, you know, what everybody has signed off on. It's increasingly becoming a tool that, that I rely on. Brilliant, yeah. And, and what kind of recent projects have you just been involved with, um, just to bring everybody up to speed? The latest thing that has been distributed is The Killer, uh, the David Fincher film. So you were fight coordinating a particular scene in that movie. So I was the, the US stunt coordinator and then the fight coordinator, and that was really my main contribution to it. There were some other things like, you know, we had a girl get her neck broken and fall down some stairs and ouch some other you know little little pieces like that but the fight was a very involved sequence in the movie the total runtime for that sequence is something like six minutes it was michael fassbender fighting a, a guy named sala baker sala is a phenomenal stunt performer i think that the first thing that he ever did was play sauron in lord of the rings Paul really humongous dude he's like you know six five and 250 pounds and so it was it was like a big smash up between the two of them destroying this house a good buddy of mine justin eaton doubled michael fassbender and and uh we spent about eight days with those guys just destroying each other which was a lot of fun what was it like uh, working with David Fincher on a project like that? Did you liaise with him directly? Yeah, yeah. He's really incredible. You know, having the opportunity to work with someone like that is such a rare treat. I remember walking out of the movie theater when I saw Seven. I turned to my wife as we were walking out and I said, that is the best movie that I will never watch again. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so kind of traumatized by, you know, that, that film. But ended up going back and watching it you know several times and with the director's commentary and read the script because i was just so intrigued by the effect that the film had had on me so i'm a massive fan of the guy you know i've been lit on fire you know i've i've done a 170 foot descender off a cliff like you know i've done some some things but previsiting that fight for fincher like starting to audition camera angles for him was like the most intimidating thing that i've ever done in my career <laughs> you know um because he's so particular uh, but it was it was a really wonderful experience because it was almost like going to film school with fincher you know as i'm shooting stuff and sending it to him and he would give me notes back and you know we would get into you know kind of a groove about how we were going to photograph the sequence he really kind of executed what the previs was it, it was awesome. It was really great. You know, there were probably, you know, 70,000 people that would have cut off their left hand to be getting notes from Fincher <laughs> on the stuff that they were shooting. So <laughs> what was the um, previous workflow like? Was it um, all Unreal Engine? Was it blocked out with stunt viz with, with video like you usually do? We shot stunt viz in a typical kind of fashion, although I did do 
quite a bit of VFX as a part of the stunt biz, you know, just to try to really visualize what this was going to be. Because there was so much like breaking things and glass and, you know, all of that kind of stuff that was playing into it. At the time that we were shooting, I was doing all of the stunt biz and, and designing the fight. All of that stuff was here in Atlanta while they were shooting in France and in the Dominican Republic. And then arrived at the, a version of the fight. I met up with the crew in New Orleans where we were shooting. That was our first opportunity to actually walk the set. Fincher is kind of known for doing many takes. Knowing how physical this fight was going to be, there's the creative side of my job where I'm like, you know, I want to do something that's interesting and, you know, fun to watch. <laughs> if you can call it fun, a lot of, you know, hopefully people are wincing when they're watching it. The other side of the job is I need to make this thing survivable for the guys that they're going to be able to do as many takes as is required from Fincher's point of view. So I worked very closely with the set designer to do things that would allow for us to, you know, like hide pads. There were sections of the house where we had wilded out the floors so that we could, you know, pop the floor out and drop an eight inch pad in, in the ground. There were a lot of, of those kinds of components. When we got to New Orleans, a lot of that stuff had already been built. We were able to walk the set with Fincher and, and Michael Fassbender. And then at that point, there were a couple of things that came up like, oh, well, what if we did this? What if we did this? But like I said, at that point, we were, you know, kind of beyond previs. But I had brought motion capture suits with me. So I went back to the hotel and threw the suit on. Really? Did the 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 new ending of the fight. I then took the the now completed previs and annotated it with, you know, really minute details about here's all the breakaway elements. Here's the things that special effects needs to be aware of. Here's what camera department needs to know. And then was able to distribute that to everybody. And so when we all walked in, everybody kind of knew what was expected. Yeah, we, with something like that, you've everybody has got to be on the same page. Inevitably, there's always something that pops up sure. that's not planned for. And um, was was there anything with this project that cropped up? And it's like, oh, we did not expect that to happen. <laughs> the fight itself was is pretty big and wild, and you know, the, like I said, we destroyed that house. There were you know a couple little things that we ended up going back to, like you know, Fincher was very specific about how he wanted the closet doors to break, and so we did several versions of that. You know, went back and talked to special effects about what parts of the door should be balsa and what parts of the door should be pine, and you know that kind of thing. And then <laughs> there's a moment of kind of levity that shows up in the fight that is not something that you know I can take responsibility for. Fastbender at one point opens a drawer and reaches in as if he's going to try to find a knife and he pulls out a cheese grater. That was like, you know, a spontaneous moment. And I remember Fincher <laughs> turned to me and he's like, am I ruining your art? And I was like, God, no, this is awesome. <laughs> he's about executing a plan. And, and that's kind of how it went. I personally haven't seen it yet, but I am very excited to, to, to watch that, especially that scene. You have to let me know how you, how you like it. You know, you, you are a stunt coordinator, you all these hats, but you, in your spare time, you do fight sequences, um, short movies, and the project that we're looking at today is called The Widow, Assassin's Highway. Can you tell us a little bit how that came about? We had these strikes that took place last year. Everybody was kind of sitting on their thumbs for a period of time, and I took the time off to write a script and, you know, play around with some ideas. And I also, during that time period, wanted to sort of push a little bit further into Unreal from what I had done with the Ronin short that I did last year, which was really the first thing that I had ever done in Unreal. And so, you know, I knew that I was only kind of grazing the surface of, of the program. And the other part of that was that I had made it a challenge for myself when I did Ronan to be the only performer. So I was doing all of the different parts. So this time I said, you know, I, I want to get a team of people together and actually do something, you know, put on multiple motion capture suits, get all the data at the same time. This short is really kind of the first scene of a longer project that I'm sort of building a pitch around. I spent the first few weeks just kind of assembling the set, creating all of the assets that I needed and getting the characters and that kind of thing. And then I did perform for everybody right up until the moment that the fight begins, then sent that section of it to all my friends and was like, hey, you know, do you guys want to get together on a weekend and, and come play around with some stuff? 
and most of them were in the same position that I was. They'd been sitting on their thumbs for a while and, you know, didn't have anything to do. Uh, a bunch of them were, they had been on Thunderbolts, the Marvel film Thunderbolts, right up until the strike started. And they were waiting for Thunderbolts to start back up again. I pulled those guys in and we got together for a couple of days at uh, my friend CC Ice's gym, Apex, and captured all the stuff that I needed for the fight. And then I took all of that data and jumped into Unreal and finished it off over the next couple of weeks. You mentioned like, yeah, a couple of my friends. I mean, these are Marvel level stunt performers. Yeah, so CC has been the stunt double for Scarlet Witch like since Infinity War. Um, and it's her gym and her husband is Justin Eaton, who I mentioned before. He was Michael Fassbender's stunt double for The Killer. He was also Chris Evans' stunt double on Endgame in the fight with Thanos. You know, so that that moment where he jumps up in the air and does the big hit with the hammer, that's Justin. John Nania, uh, who doubles Sebastian Stan, was there with me in great collection of friends of mine that are all incredibly talented. Dan Carter and Jess Durham, Sarah Irwin, they're all phenomenal yeah cl clearly that gym then that's owned um is it cc that owns yeah is it a typical gym where public could use or is it designed for stunt coordinators like you got yeah, to go in apex is a it's a stunt gym usually it's like stunt performers will come in and train there but cc also rents it out to productions so you know there there might be a show in town and they need some place to do their stunt biz is there a big cupboard with huge cardboard boxes by any chance there as well? is but, yeah <laughs> yeah there's a lot of cardboard boxes and rubber weapons and pads and you know, yeah all that good stuff that's actually where we did the the stunt biz for the killer as well oh amazing any um rubber cheese graters that have props to use no no, that's that's something I have to talk to CC about that. She's got to get something. <laughs> awesome, man. Awesome. What kind of suits and what kind of setup? I know you're in the CC's gym. What kind of motion capture technology was everybody using? So we we use the Rococo suits, and I, you know that company. I, I love those people. They they were so helpful because I'd had a couple little issues with like one suit had a problem, and you know, so I called them and they set me up with a guy in in italy and he like I've fixed everything been in the same boat they their, their customer service and they sent out like new wires and says oh we'll sort this yeah. out and we'll go on a tech call and they were kind of decoding like script yes yeah and exactly the thing so i had four four suits and one pair of gloves and so cc did the, the work as the widow sarah and travis would alternate doing different elements for the kid i had my computer there and i brought a dedicated router we had you know four performers at a time that were in suits and yeah it was great we're big fans of rococo and we've you, we've got rococo suits ourselves and a great piece of kit and they're all you know their customer service their products everything amazing i'm starting to play now i just got the coil have you used it or you've just received I, it? I just received it. I'm just starting to play with it. I, I have a feeling that I will regret not having delayed doing the short <laughs> so that oh, I can really? the oil. And you mentioned about the Ronin. You were fighting yourself. Whereas this, the data that's involved is easier to work with in some sense. What was that like receiving um, all the data for all the, the, the actors compared to trying to time? It made me kick myself in the butt for the way that I did Ronin. You know, even though I think it's probably longer than the fight in Ronin, you know, it, it was like from the time that I got the motion capture data to where I uploaded the video to YouTube was two weeks. You know, it was just, it was really made so much easier, <laughs> you know, by virtue of that fact. I can imagine. I've got a question here of what did you learn from the Ronin project? I imagine that is a big take from it is if more than one person's fighting, definitely try and get another person in a suit. Yeah. And I, you know, I knew that going into it, it you know, I knew that I was going to run into those kinds of problems. But, you know, like I said, it was just kind it of a challenge. Yeah, can I do it? I knew how to open Unreal when I started that. And that was it. <laughs> it's crazy. And so with this project, I already had, you know, certain amount of information under my belt, but I wanted to get into, you know, certain other things like, you know, smoke simulations and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, and then furthering what I was doing in the way of like, you know, lighting. And, and of course the Ronin short was deliberately without dialogue. This one has some, you know, facial motion capture and 
dialogue elements. And, you know, so that was all part of it too. And I'm thinking about it as, let's say, overcreated uh, animatic sequence. You know, this would be a project that if I were to do it, I would like to do a live action version of this. So this is like the animatic for the first scene of the film. In an ideal world, what would happen is that somebody looks at it and goes, that's a great idea. Dave, go direct this movie. Here's a bunch of money and, um, you know, you're off to the races. And at that point, I would certainly approach it from the standpoint of using the technology for animatic previs. Of course. My personal feeling is that you're going to end up with something that's a whole lot closer to reality when you're really doing it with bodies. So having the opportunity to do animatic viz with motion capture in a, an environment that's, you know, not like the 92 camera optical motion capture setup is pretty great. So that would be the approach that I would want to take. If I was directing a film, it makes sense to me to go ahead and just do a motion capture version of the movie first. You know, I look at like the creator that came out last year as, as such an inspiration from from that standpoint. You know, they they went into it not just like we're we're gonna pull out the money hose and solve all of our problems in post, but rather being very surgical. And and I, I think that's super cool. Yeah, the the whole approach to the creator and monsters. Yeah, very inspirational. It wasn't so much like I want to go into Unreal and learn how to do this. It was more okay, this is what is required. So now I have to figure out how to do that in Unreal. Some advice that you gave to people last time was a bit like learning software and learning Unreal in particular. You had an end goal and you then worked backwards and worked out what you needed to learn. So then you approached with a tick list, okay, I need to learn how to record mocap and import it in. So you kind of work backwards from your goal, whereas a lot of people think, where do I start without a, a goal in mind? And they kind of they can get lost a little bit with le trying to learn everything. Yeah, there's just, it, it's too deep. You know, there's too many things that you can do. And so you end up in a, a situation, and I, I fall victim to this too. Like you start looking at stuff and you'll go down like a tutorial rabbit hole and say, oh, there's this other, th wait, what's that that you can do? And then next thing you know, you're like three hours into watching tutorials, but they don't necessarily apply to the thing that you're trying to do. I was getting to a place where it was definitely delaying my ability to finish. So I ended up just using Cinema 4D to do all the smoke stuff and then compositing that because it was just a, a much faster process for me because I already knew how to do it. It's a storytelling medium as far as I'm concerned. And so you just start going, okay, well, what do, what do I have to do? In the same way that you would do a film, like, you know, if, if I go back to talking about The Killer, I could get into a whole thing about, you know, what the exterior of the building looked like, but that didn't apply to anything that we were doing. The fight was the fight. So if I'm going to design the fight, I have to be worried about what happens inside of those walls. What was the big takeaway from um, this particular project? Yeah, you know, I, I do really want to get into the, the fluid stuff. It's new, obviously, like within the last couple of iterations of Unreal. Just in this case, it was, I was starting to go, oh my, you know, this is going to take me longer than I than I want to. I got too impatient. Maybe on the next one. But at the same time, I know what you're saying. Like, it's it's the balance, isn't it, of I still need to learn stuff along the way. And you know, right. yes, I want some effects in there because it looks cool and it's needed. But you, there's the balance of I can't spend like four months learning how to do a particle simulation if it's only for like three shots. Yeah. And, and I think too, for me as a filmmaker, you know, both in, in my capacity as a stunt coordinator or as a second unit director or whatever, every one of these things that I do helps me to understand the post process in a way that, you know, sometimes some of my peers may not. Having the ability to recognize those things makes me a more efficient as a filmmaker, but also more production friendly because speaking the same language as the VFX supervisor, as an example. So even at this stage, for the limited amount of stuff that I've done with fluid simulation and in Unreal, it's enough that I, I could have a conversation with somebody in an educated way, which is, you know, like going back to where we were talking about the creator, it's, it's the same kind of thing. Gareth Edwards, he understands. He's not guessing. And I've seen that happen so many times. Like you, you'll be on a set with a director and they'll make what really is a kind of capricious decision. I think it would be cool if we did this. 
And then you'll see the VFX supervisor's face just go yeah. white because all of a sudden it went from like a five thousand dollar shot to a hundred thousand dollar shot. I mean, Gareth Ed was going out to like you know places like New Mexico in Monsters when he's just going to film something with a vision and going, okay, there's going to be something like kind of coming from the background over there. There's no like tracking markers and stuff. He knows what he's going to be involved and. In. You know, he knows what needs to be done. You, you know, let's not move the camera too much because there's going to be too much motion blur. Then the tracking is going to be more difficult. Well, and that's the genius of someone too, like Fincher, you know, because Fincher's background is in VFX. He, he started off, I think the first thing that he ever did was the chicken walker sequence in, in Return of the Jedi. Oh, really? Yeah, he was with ILM doing that as a young man. God, the, the VFX that that guy does in his films, you have no idea. There's a sequence in the film where somebody, where Fassbender's character is escaping uh, an area on a moped. There's four shots in there that are fully CG that nobody ever knows. They're the best ones. If you can't, if you don't spot them, then that's, never that's seen a successful never seen VFX shot. With all departments, like that guy knows everybody's job. So he was smart in the way that the fight is largely in the dark. And part of the reason for that, he knew they were going to be in France and the Dominican Republic. How much time are we really going to have to rehearse with Michael Fassbender? And we, we had like a day and a half with him. And he's phenomenal, like super coordinated guy. And, and he picked up on like the whole fight. Like he was great. But because of the way that it was shot, we were able to rely very heavily on the stunt double. But that was also by design. That was Fincher yeah. knowing the lighting months down the road that that was probably going to be the best way to approach that sequence when you're working with someone like david fincher or or any director that's working on such a big fight sequence like that one you know things change all the time and you plan as much as possible but is there ever a moment where it's kind of like can we have this happen but there's this kind of limits to the set not on killer but that does happen a lot i think about fight choreography as dialogue Okay, it's, it, you know, a fight is a physical argument. From my perspective, I come into it thinking like, here's a character, how does this character talk? You know, there's what's actually coming out of their mouth, but there's a physical vocabulary too. Fassbender, at the time that we were shooting, he was dieting down because he races cars professionally when he's not acting. I think he was like 145 pounds. What is the vocabulary of these two guys? How do they fight? You know, Saul is not a guy that's going to be, you know, particularly defensively orientated. You know, he's not going to be thinking about how do I block. With fight choreography, it's an illusion. At a certain point, you're going to put the camera in a place where you just clearly he didn't hit him, right? So sometimes you'll have a piece of fight choreography that you've designed to be photographed from a certain angle. And then you get in the room and the DP says, I want to backlight the guy. Let's put the camera over here. And the illusion falls apart. So now you have to re-choreograph that portion of the fight because of where the camera is. And sometimes that pulls the thread out of the sweater. You change this move and the next move and the next move and the next move are all impacted by what you just did. So I find myself sometimes in a position of having to weigh it out and say, okay, the simplest solution to the problem that has now been created by this new camera position is to do X, Y, or Z. But that's not in the vocabulary of the character. He wouldn't do that. Now there is this like push and pull of how do I not destroy the rest of the choreography of the sequence that we have, you know, rehearsed that the actor is now familiar with that we have prepared so that, you know, we're going to get thrown into this wall, but now you've put the camera there. And if I change this move, that means that we're going to get thrown into that wall and that wall isn't padded. Like I said, it didn't happen with Fincher because he knew like this, this is what the fight is going to be. It's an interesting thing too, because, you know, like if you're going to talk about an auteur kind of director that you would expect is like, I'm going to grab that steering wheel and I'm just going to take it where I want to go. He was so collaborative. That's interesting about the personality of the character. And I guess sometimes as a viewer, you might overlook that, but it makes complete sense that um, a certain type of character wouldn't do a certain type of thing. Talking about personalities in fighting, I was watching a Deadpool breakdown of, you know, the opening kind of pitch sequence on the highway that they did. Every stunt performer, like those moments in between, right. you have to analyze the way that Ryan Reynolds would move or stand or his like little kind of comedy moments. 
Have you seen this man? <laughs> I think I watched the same video yesterday. Oh, really? <laughs> but yeah, those sort of like nuances, all the, the head movements, the timings, you have to analyze that and then implement that into the performance that you're doing. That has to feel like the actor because you want it to be as seamless as possible to not know where the, the stunt performer was right. being used and not. Yeah, this is something that sometimes I, I wish that, you know, filmmakers that are working with the stunt department could come in and, and hear the conversations that we have because we think about those things quite deeply. You know, like you're saying, it, you know, it might be a, an acting beat. Interestingly, like, you know, so for the Deadpool thing, I, I did a project it was like two weeks ago and Tim Miller was there. Oh, uh, really? I to talk, nice. got to talk to him a little bit about, about that show. And uh, a really good buddy of mine, one of my best friends in the world, Larry Lamb, is the guy that's sitting in the passenger seat that ends up getting thrown up onto the freeway sign and then slides off at the end. That, that's like one of my best <laughs> friends in the world. So brilliant. What's kind of um, next for you in terms of like projects, personal projects? Right now I'm, I'm working on my own stuff. Um, I have a huge project that's coming at the end of this year that I'm incredibly excited about it's going to be both challenging and a lot of fun and kind of a bucket list thing yeah and you know and then in the meantime i'm helping friends out on shows that they're doing you know right now is kind of calm before the storm while i'm a soldier on other people's shows <laughs> you know i'll go in and help shoot help shoot a previs on this or i've got like a stunt acting role on another friend show that i'm doing and you know and then in the meantime just working on Unreal. Awesome. You know, a, a really nice um, stunt community and family. I, I'll get the feeling of, of, of that. As stunt performers, we're in a position where quite often you're putting your life in somebody else's hands. You know, like like I said, I did a 170 foot descender. I was not responsible for my safety in that situation. I just needed to be willing to jump off of this cliff and looked at the team that was there and said, okay, you guys got me. And they said, yep. And I said, okay. Um, same thing, you know, if you're going to be on fire, you are at the mercy of the people that are there to put you out. The next level type of trust. Yeah. If you're hesitating in a moment because you're unsure, that can cause an injury. You know, when they say three, two, one, go, I go on the G of go, I'm going, you know, now as a coordinator, I'm up all night. Like, what did I forget? What did, you know, what's the thing? What, you know, what am I not thinking about? What is the, you know, the wrinkle here that could create a problem? Because these are my friends, you know, these are people that I care deeply about that I want to make sure are going to be safe. So yeah, that, that relationship, you know, becomes pretty tight, pretty quick, especially with people that you work with a lot. How do you like deal with that side of did I prep enough or did I thoroughly prep that parachute for the person that's going to jump out of, of an airplane? You know, that's a good analogy. That's sort of the way it is. I mean, you know, I'll, I create checklists and, you know, and think, and then I talk to people, you know, the other people that are on the team, I'll ab flat out ask the question. I'm like, what am I forgetting? Even if it's just to get them thinking about the same problem, there are some people that kind of keep things close. Like they don't want to share all the information. Usually when I'm working on a show, I'll walk in at the beginning of the day and gather the team around and I tell them everything that I know. You know, you, you talk about like team and everybody needs to be on the same page and understand everything and, and you need to be open about information. Do you have to highlight any kind of people's behaviors to say, uh, can we trust that mindset of that person? I usually, and I think that this is true of most uncoordinators, I vet my people pretty carefully, you know? It's not common that I would just like, you know, take a chance with somebody that was in, in an important position. The one exception to that is a, a girl named Hannah Scott, who is one of my favorite people on the planet. She's freaking awesome. And I was doing Falcon and Winter Soldier and the antagonist in the show happened to look a lot like Hannah. And I knew people that knew her that I liked very much that liked her. And so I was like, I'm going to take a chance and bring her in. And she ended up being like an MVP. Like she was really? freaking awesome. She's actually the girl that I called to do the neck break on, uh, on Fincher's show. <laughs> and for that, 
his plan had been to do a ragdoll simulation of this body falling down the stairs, but he wanted a reference. So I was going to bring Hannah in to do this, to do this stair fall, but I wasn't sure like how crazy we needed to get. And then Hannah got there and she does the fall and I go, are you okay? And she's like, you know, <laughs> and is like badass and like the sweetest girl. And so I'm like, okay, cool. And I go around the corner to Fincher and he turns around and he goes, well, I guess we don't have to have to do that in CG. Oh, amazing. <laughs> so we, we did, I think we did three takes, which may be the fewest number of takes that he's ever done up anything. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. So, so Hannah coming in as a, oh, it's just, it could potentially just be a reference shoot. Turns out to be, that was. Yeah, that was her. Yeah. Th thanks, Dave. I mean, that was uh, amazing. And it's such, uh, so great to have you back on um, and just to follow you know, where you're going and what you're up to and projects like this. We definitely look forward to the next one. Yeah, we wish you all the best on, on that, Dave. Thank you, you too. Uh, really, really do, so. And congrats on the baby. Thank you, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's the best, best best thing ever, so thanks, Dave. But have a great rest of your day and um, thank you again and we'll, we'll, we'll speak soon. Sounds good. Take care. All right.